The 1970s was a reactionary decade. A reaction against the counterculture of the 1960s, a reaction against the post-war welfare state, and a reaction against prevailing alcohol trends as boomers went from protest to home guests. I'm Jeff. I'm Ryan. Welcome to Stirring Up the Leaves. And today we're going back to the 70s and tasting four of the most popular wines from that decade. Jumping in our time machine. Let's go. Wine number one, courtesy of California, Carlo Rossi, in a three liter jug, no less. Oh, wow. Perfect. I like that. That's a great format. We've seen a lot of formats on this show. That was a quality cap right there. Oh, God. <laughs> to the brim, please. Thank you. Pour myself a little bit less than that. Can we Actually, hold glass? could you, uh, yeah, hold my glass? It's not easy pouring these three liter jugs, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, not the shirt, not my 70s shirt. This is our dinner parties went in the 70s, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and we're starting with the jug format and we're starting with the red wine because we're actually going to go dry to sweet on this episode so a slightly different order uh but starting with the jug wine because the 70s saw a transition in terms of drinking trends specific to wine where post prohibition in the united states really up until the 60s and early 70s the majority of domestic wine was consumed in a jug format that's your volume you need that it's about kind of honest cheap wines and actually the interesting thing they're not necessarily altogether that honest either you know a lot of these <laughs> jug brands had what ended up being kind of grandfathered names that today would not be legal so you had carlo rossi had or still has actually burgundy, burgundy chianti you know those are protected geographical names uh but yeah the 70s were kind of the the decade of wine discovery in North America. And so wine culture really grew in that decade, really substantially. And uh, people were looking for wines that kind of emulated famous European wines. And that's why you saw the transition in the format. Through the decade, people were transitioning to higher quality wines. And that meant going from that beautiful three liter jug to <laughs> our traditional 750, 750 milliliter mil. bottle. So Carlo Rossi, this is a Gallo brand, uh, started actually in the early 1950s, but it wasn't until the 1970s that Ernest Gallo decided to make Carlo Rossi into a national brand. And that was when actually a relative through marriage, Charlie Rossi, after whom the line's named, went on radio and TV and turned this into the brand that it has become and became one of the second largest wine brands in the U.S. at a point in time. I think that's a, that's a similar topic we'll see across all these wines. It's like the TV ads and just the, the sheer advertisement that was behind these, these brands is un, unparalleled to what you see today. Right. It's not a surprise, you know, the, the success that they achieved. Yeah. We're going to try the California Reds. And what does that mean? Honestly, I have no clue because it's unclear what the grape varieties are. It is red. That is true and honest. It is red. It's very grapey. I think it could be quite grapey, very it's convected. Grapey. You know, it's like uh, just off the vine into jug. <laughs> vine to jug. It's almost, yeah, like Welch. Welch's style, yeah. Like, I know it's not, we're going to get into a wine a little later that is made with the same variety, grape variety, that's in Welch grape, but this is still very, uh, very grapey. You could see how this would appeal to an entry level wine consumer, someone who's just getting into wine. You know, very familiar flavor profile, like that grapiness. And then from a palate perspective, slight residual sugar, it's about 16 grams per liter of residual sugar. That would be roughly like an eighth of what's in Coca-Cola, just as a comparison. And almost no tannins, so it goes down super quick. You can see why they put this in jug. It's really like, it's just juice. I'm um, curious what the alcohol is on this, do you know? 12%. 12%. So it's balanced by all that sugar. 
It's just watery. It's lean. Yeah, lean, but sweet, and uh, easy drinking. Easy drinking, and it's not flawed in any way. Like maybe if someone put this in my glass, I would drink it. This is like what a kid pitchers wine to taste like. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh just yeah. Just like oh, it's grape juice with some alcohol in it. Yeah. That's kind of what that is. And you could see how someone would move up the quality ladder after having this. How could you though, with the bargain that it is, three liters for how much? Uh, in the U.S., you could get three liters for roughly fifteen dollars. <laughs> a gallon. <laughs> a gallon. <laughs> Nearly a gallon. Oh goodness. I love the glassware though. All right, Jack, you ready for wine number two? Let's get into it. We've got the Matus Rosé, which is a uh, slightly, slightly sparkling wine. Oh yeah, listen to it. I actually quite like the packaging, I'll be honest. Matus, so brand started in 1945, just after World War II. And uh, originally it was for export to Brazil, of all places. Brazil? But, yeah, but then they found a, a, a burgeoning market in North America. And they were uh, drink, uh, hungry drinkers for all things European after just coming back from the war. And it grew exponentially till the end of the 1970s where this represented 40% of Portugal's uh, wine export. Wow. This singular product, <laughs> <laughs> which is insane because they export a ton of port. I mean, it's funny because Portugal, outside of Matus, is not necessarily a country that you even think of rosé necessarily. No, you, you think of port, you think of big, opulent reds, you think of the whites you enjoy with seafood. Let's get into it. Let's try it. Kind and of like dark color. It's made from uh, Shiraz and like Baga. Really? Baga. So like really tannic, high acid, thick skin, dark fruit. A little bit of effervescence. Not sparkling, but semi-sparkling. Just gives it a nice kind of freshness and liveliness on the palate. I've never had this, this is delicious. I can <laughs> see. <laughs> Very light, you know, yeah. the, color, the color you kind of think, oh, maybe this is a heavier style of rosé. It's not though, quite light and refreshing. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too, the, um, the jug, very confected fruit, very grapey. But this actually tastes like real fruits. Yeah, and it's, it's not complex, it's pretty simple, but it's fruity, it's well balanced. Like, obviously there's some sugar there, so there's some residual sugar. Yeah, and we're about 15 grams per liter roughly on this one. So again, that'd be an eighth, let's say, uh, of what's in Coca-Cola. Cool. But they balance it nicely with the uh, effervescence and it's just crushable, which is uh, probably why it's so, sold so well. So given its popularity, uh, there's definitely some fun, some fun trivia about this wine. It's a favorite of Queen Elizabeth II. It was stockpiled in Saddam Hussein's private cellar. <laughs> <laughs> they were looking for weapons of mass destruction and they found Matus. <laughs> like uh, Andre the Giant, supposedly it was purported that he drank like six bottles of this before a match. Wow. It's in uh, Elton John's lyrics. It's seen a lot of people's dinner tables. And it's still on shelves today. And you can see why. It's, I think it's a quality product. All right, Jeffrey, wine number three. Well, you know, the 1960s and 70s were known for their kind of bold, psychedelic colors. So much so that even nuns went from black gowns to blue gowns. <laughs> and that was where the name Blue Nun came from, supposedly. Are you serious? <laughs> Uh, no, I, that is complete fabrication. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, when the label went to the printer, the printer gaffed and the robes ended up blue, and hence <laughs> the name Blue Nun was born. Oh, perfect. But this is a wine that dates to 1921, was rebranded in the 1950s uh, with the slogan, Right for Every Meal. And I think we talked about the fact that you're in that post-war period where people have a bit of confusion and almost like today, people are scared of wine. Like, oh, when do I drink it? How do I drink it? Uh, and so Blue Nun comes out and says, well, just, just drink it. Just drink it <laughs> with anything. <laughs> and Great marketing. It worked. It, and so much so that into the 70s, they got into radio ads uh, with Stiller in uh, Mira. So if you know Jerry Stiller, Ben Stiller's dad, uh, they were advertising this. Best in power, baby. Yes. 
And it worked because by the 1980s, this was selling over a million cases a year in the U.S. alone. Well, let's give it a go. Let's jump into it. I've never had this. So this is a common theme in this show. I've never had this. I don't know if I've had this, to be honest. It is a blue bottle. It's a blue bottle. The wine's not blue, though. It's not a blue wine, which is relevant now. Probably wasn't rele relevant in the 70s. It's hard to uh, swirl in these crystal glasses. As beautiful as they are. So this is from Germany. This is from throughout Germany. It's not from a specific region. Um, and it's from the Ravanner grape, which is actually just a renamed, or a new name, I should say, for Müller Turgau. Oh, that wasn't a sexy enough name for them? Well, it's interesting because- There was a negative connotation to it, or? Part of the success for Blue Nun was overcoming just how scary German wine labels are. <laughs> and I'm not just talking about that crazy Gothic font. It's not easy to understand what you're really reading on the label. So right. Blue Nun simplifies that, and I guess Ravanner's the logical extension of just take anything German off the label. <laughs> but Müller Turgau is known for its bulk production, mm -hmm. largely grown in areas. They're poor quality sites where maybe Riesling can't thrive necessarily. Right. Not picking up a whole lot on the nose, but the crystal doesn't necessarily help. It's, uh, you know, citrus. Citrusy, yeah. Maybe a little tree fruit, apple-y, pear-y type of thing, but very simple. Not overly ripe, not overly complicated. Again, you have a little bit of effervescence, just kind of like slight sparkle there, which gives it a nice kind of liveliness and freshness. Citrus fruit, and just like everything so far, easy drinking. You know, this is actually only 9.5% alcohol. So it's something oh, yeah. that you could smash back pretty easily. That's very sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and probably the Blue Nun that we're tasting today isn't like it would have been in the 70s. You know, oh. Supposedly, it's gotten a little drier over time. Although this is still 30 grams per liter of residual sugar. Apparently it's drier than what it would have been back in the day. And part of that is ownership change. Um, was sold mm. in the 90s, new owners, who kind of rejuvenated the brand in a sense. And so now we have you know the traditional kind of Blue Nun Ravanner, also known as uh, Authentic White in some markets. Mm. But they have a Riesling, and they also have a 24K gold sparkling wine, <laughs> which is a lot. So they're very much aiming for a millennial crowd, I would say, a younger crowd, which is interesting too, because we think of these wines from the 70s, how they haven't aged our relics of the past, but that's really not true at all. They are keeping up have strong sales still and are adapting their marketing strategies to, to a new demographic. Right. That's disparate from the other wines that we've tried because the, the wines we've tried so far and another one that's coming kind of built these massive brands. Mm -hmm. It was like the foundation of where they started and it's still the same ownership, the same family or the same corporation. And it's interesting too, because like some of the other wines, this had its imitators as well. And Black Tower mm. would be the obvious one. You know, definitely growing up, my grandparents always had Black yeah. Tower. Yeah, Black Tower was around. On the dinner table. But that same style in terms of light, slightly sweet, lower alcohol. But I think overall, if I was to summarize this wine, and I, if I thought of, okay, what's a generic white wine? This almost comes to mind. Yeah. You know, I could taste this like, ah, yes, that is the generic white wine. And generic it is. But perfectly drinkable. Don't pair this with everything. <laughs> uh, for me, what I mean is stereotypical, but this is spicier food, arguably. Would I pair this with any sort of meat? Absolutely not. All right, uh, one number four. Jeffrey, we're jumping into the pride of Canada, baby duck. I'm excited. Oh yeah. Let me get into this. Actually, should we? I love the crystal, but maybe let's get a proper wine glass for a wine of this caliber. This is a different caliber level, that's for sure. Oh yes, I love this. Covered stem, everything. Okay, so baby duck 
was the foundation of a corporation called Andrew Peller Limited. The largest, uh, look at that, I've never seen that in my life. <laughs> it's happening right now. It's a plastic cork with some oh, sort wow. of weird wire hood. And so this wine was kind of modeled after the Matus that we had earlier. Okay. So there was a company, another Canadian company called Bright's, and they had this wine called Bright's Wineette that you could get a six bottle pack. And, you know, Andre was his name. Andrew thought he could do it better. So he introduced Baby Duck. And Americans will be probably familiar with the wines called like Cold Duck. This is where this got its name. Baby duck. Oh, it's just a uh, direct ripoff. Oh, direct ripoff. But then even after this one got its popularity, there was other Canadian imitations like Canada duck and love a duck and funnel duck. <laughs> it's just... So why the obsession with ducks in the 70s? Okay, so I looked into this, the etymology behind baby duck, and it is absolutely absurd. So there's a tradition uh, in European. Okay interesting color in the european culture that at the end of a night at the end of a party you take all the dregs from the wine bottles and you put it all in the bowl together and you call it in german you call it the cult de ende which <laughs> that is, sounds like a drinking game in university yeah well it is for sure <laughs> um which means the cold end in english and supposedly somebody thought that sounded like cold duck <laughs> <laughs> Cold duck. I'm assuming they had finished the bowl of cold end in, uh, in order to make, like, I don't see how you'd ever get cold duck from that. But anyways, that's where baby duck came from. And uh, obviously that's kind of a, an ironic wording because a baby duck is called a duckling. But not as <laughs> ironic as the wine called baby duckling, which is just redundant. Right. Another Canadian wine. Oh my God. <laughs> I have had this one before. Uh, wow. So this is a rosé, sparkling wine, lowest alcohol we've seen. What's this? 7% and probably the sweetest we've seen. Yeah, I think this is roughly 50 grams per liter residual sugar. So that brings us almost half of what's in Coca-Cola. That's, th this is dessert wine territory. It smells so, like Welch's. It, well, there's a reason it smells like Welch's, because one of the predominant grape varieties in this is Concord. Ah, uh, the, the eating grape. The eating grape, but it, yeah, so Welch's uh, produces a ton of this for grape jams, uh, grape flavored like popsicles pop, the grape juice Welch's, all that very grapey flavor mm. comes from predominantly that grape. And so, uh, Andres, this wine was originally made by Andres from this guy named on Andreas Peller, Andrew Peller. Uh, he thought, you know, let's make a wine like Matus, but let's, you know, if I use this Concord grape, if I use more native varieties, native North American grape varieties that are produced super cheaply, mm -hmm. then I can produce the wine super cheap. Brilliant. And what also goes along with that was the, uh, the alcohol laws at the time means you were taxed less on a lower alcohol percentage wine, hence the 7%. Ah, uh, okay. So it was all about making money. And well, I mean, let's... it's a major corporation today, <laughs> so obviously it worked. Let's try it. I think well, it's gonna taste how it smells, which is it's just a- 100% great. Great. <laughs> oh, wow. It kind of tastes like if you had grape jam and diluted it down so that you could drink it somehow. This is what I imagine it tastes like. So this wine obviously was the foundation of Andrew Peller, uh, but in large part was the foundation of the Canadian wine industry. Cause I think even today they still sell a significant volume of this. And that's interesting to me because like some of the other brands that we've had have tried to keep up with the times, you know, re uh, rejuvenated the packaging. 
But this, to me, looks like it could be a straight out of the 70s. Like, I don't know. I don't know if, I don't know if they could change the date. label, to be honest. Like, ba uh, sorry, Blue Nun. There was a bit of a stigma attached to the German wine industry as a result of that wine. Right. Negative connotation with German wines. Uh, that was seen in the Canadian wine industry as well. But I think most notably because this wine was massive, massive in Canada. Mm -hmm. And they got maybe some false sense of security that they started exporting it to Britain oh, no. in the late 1970s. And there was a, a, a quote that I read from the London Sunday Times because, you know, they're established wine culture, wine drinkers. So the quote was like, this purple drink, sparkling stuff that tastes of black currant wine gums has been dissolved in a glass of Andrew's liver salt. <laughs> Serve extremely cold, preferably on a stick, and you might be surprised by its presumption. <laughs> that is savage. In a way only the Brits could really do. <laughs> yeah. But it's not wrong either. It seems like a style, like let's be honest, is aimed at a younger consumer, but then you have packaging that's like so disconnected from that. Yeah. That I'd just love to know like who's buying this right now. I'd love to know, because the, the label hasn't changed. I don't think the recipe has changed. It's just been the same. I mean, what, what can you say? It's just grapes in a bottle with a little bit of alcohol. To, yeah, it's water, sugar, and grapes, I think. You could probably make this at home. Just take a bottle of Welch's, take a bottle of vodka, measure it a couple shots of vodka, pour it in. Use in a soda stream. There. Oh yeah, you got the soda stream at home. You basically have this. I don't know if you're farther ahead actually from a price perspective, because this in Magnum was just over 10 bucks, yeah. so. Well, there's a reason, because the grapes are dirt cheap. I feel like every Canadian should have this once in their life. Every American should have cold duck once Maybe in their the life. Equivalent is, yeah. But especially in Canada, you know, the fact that this played such a pivotal role, both positively and negatively for the Canadian wine industry, it's great to see like this is where we came from and then this is where we are today. Having said that, like Andrew Peller has a whole, they got the whole spectrum of wine qualities. They've got like super premium wineries and they've got stuff like Baby Duck. That was uh, the 70s. It's a great decade. So that's a new shit. It's a great decade. The wines, I think some have improved arguably and still are worth visiting today. I think of what we tried, what would you go back to? Oh, Matus, 100% up the four. Not I'm the question. same, I think. Yeah, I, could, I, I would see myself buying that again. And perfect it makes candle. the perfect candle holder. Oh, yeah. And that's the 70s. Well, if you like that video, like, like, subscribe, subscribe, hit the alarm bell, alarm, so you'll be notified of all the upcoming videos. And if you have any memories or lack of memories from drinking 70s wines, <laughs> throw them in the comments. <laughs> Yeah. Because we'd love to hear we'd about love it. We'd love to hear about it, for sure.